before you this morning, and God, once again, we just want to thank you for your goodness and your love and your mercy. And Father, we thank you for your word that leads us and guides us and corrects us, points us in the path of truth. And Father, we ask right now that your word do, do just that, that Father, we learn more about your word and who we are in you. Father, let your, your word just be that seed that takes root in our hearts to spring up to bear much fruit. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 says this, 16 through 26. There's a few verses there. And it says, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They're in conflict with each other, so that you are not so that you are not to do whatever you want. <clears throat> but if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, Drunkenness, orgies, and the like, I warn you, as I did before, though, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, let's just pause right there for just a second. Now, some of those things that I just read right there about the acts of the flesh might not pertain to you, but some of those things might. And uh, what we got to do is we, we really got to take an inventory of what's going on in our life. You know... Fits of rage, anger, jealousy, um, envy, and strife. I think that's more um, damaging to the body of Christ right now than almost anything else. Because those things are sometimes things that we can keep almost in our private life, if you will. All right? We, we can... Uh, you know, just you know, gossip about one or two things here and there, and then when all of a sudden we start destroying the body of Christ, we, do, we start destroying each other by just by being jealous of what other people's got, by being jealous of, of, of other churches or, you know, other people in church or just having some envy and strife. You know, the, the word says where, wherever envy and strife is, it opens the door to every evil thing. Every evil thing, when there's envy and strife going on in your household, if, you know, hey guys, let's pay attention. Uh, as head of our house, you know, if there's envy and strife going on there, we, we need to do something to stop that. Because if we don't, it's going to open the door to every evil thing. Now, hey, that's not my words. That's the word of God. And so that, we need to do something about that. We've got to stand. And when we see these things start to try to attack our house, we need to come against it. Amen? We've got to. And we've got to stand on the word. And it says, but the fruit of the Spirit, and how do we come against it? Here we go. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, patience. Okay? We're bearing some patience right there. Uh, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Jesus Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and, and envying each other. Now, man, he, he, he says a whole lot there in a few short scriptures about what our life is to look like and what, how we're supposed to walk. And it says if we're walking by the Spirit, we ought to live by the Spirit. And it says our flesh and our spirit, they're, they're constantly tugging at each other so that we don't do whatever we want to do. Now, how many of you in here this morning uh, sometimes give in to the flesh? A little bit. Well, half of you are holy. The half of you, now, you guys that didn't raise your hands, I'm here to tell you you're a liar. Okay? <laughs> And you just gave in to your flesh because you didn't want to raise your hand. But no, our flesh is something that we're, go we're going to constantly have to battle with. Do you know the one thing that we'll never do in heaven? Does anybody know the one thing we'll never have to do in heaven? Repent. We'll never have to repent in heaven. Why? Because there will be no sin. But as long as we're living on this earth, guess what? We got to repent. Because we're not holy. No, we got the Holy Spirit living in us, and we're, I'm gonna, we're gonna talk about that in just a minute. But as long as we're, you know, living here, trying to make, you know, things work and, and stuff like that, hey, let me tell you something. Our flesh is gonna trip us up from time to time. 
But thank God he has put his spirit in us because it says, you know what, when your flesh starts to rise up, the, the spirit is, is going to pull you back down. He's going to pull you back, back to the cross so that we don't do the things that we want to do, that we live. And so we've got to live by the spirit and we've got to walk by the spirit. Amen. And, I, you know, I know a lot of times I, I might have spoken about the fruit of the Spirit, but, I, I mean, when you really get down to it, you know, it, it's so amazing that love is the first fruit of the Spirit that's mentioned. Love, joy, and peace. Love, joy, and peace kind of all go hand in hand. And, but we're going to talk about love in just a second, but I, want, I just want to, I got this great Bible here. Man, I tell you, my, my phone's a good tool. But when you get a good Bible that has some good study notes, hey, I'm telling you what, you need to get one if you don't have one. It, it, it's so helpful. But the first fruit of the Spirit is love. And I, want you, I just want you to listen to the definition because, you know, I've said, you know, all these all the time, but I never really stopped and thought about the definition of, of some of them. And, uh, you know, some of you might be like me, might be a little slow, so we're going to define these things. Love, and the love that's talking about right here is, is agape love, agape love, and it's a, a sacrificial love, a sacrificial unmerited deeds to help people, to help the poor, to help the, the brokenhearted, to help the one that needs help. It's, a, it's unmerited, all right? It's something that goes undeserved. They, they don't deserve your help, but you go ahead and give it to them. They don't deserve your love, but you go ahead and give it to them. It, it's an agape kind of love, and um, it's sacrificial it's something that goes against kind of what you want to do. It's, it's a sacrifice to do some of these things. Okay? That is, that's what kind of love it's talking about. Sacrificial, unmerited deeds to help a poor, needy, or just someone who's brokenhearted, broken spirit, you know, somebody like that. Joy. Joy, um, it's an inner, inner happiness not dependent on outward circumstances. Now, if you have the fruit of the spirit of joy, you have an inward happiness despite what's going on around you. We need joy so much in our body today that we can't, I mean, we, we need joy because the circumstances that are going on around us aren't so joyful, right? And if we stop and think about the circumstances that are going around, hey, we could get all twisted. We could get all upset. And you know what? Then we could let the world come in and steal the joy that we have. Why? Because the outward circumstances coming in and attacking us, we let it get us down. But the Word says, look, you have the Spirit of God living in you, and it's the Holy Spirit that's alive in you, and that joy, don't let anything take it away. It doesn't matter what's going on, right? you got joy. You, you, you should have joy. Um, peace. Harmony in all relationships is what this is talking about. Peace with your brothers. Peace, you know, we're real good at having peace with our friends, aren't we? We're real good at having peace with people that we like or, you know, people that are like-minded we can have peace with. But hey, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes people can be so unnerving, can't they? They can be such a burden or a pain you know and it's hard to have you know that kind of relationship with them right and you know the bible says enemies and things like that but hey he's saying look right here this word peace you got to have harmony in all relationships even with that that sorry no good sucker that did you wrong you need to have harmony with him you need to live in peace with him you don't need to be running your mouth about him he could be running his mouth about you or vice versa you know in the workplace um I was talking to a lady this week, and she, you know, she works in the hospital, and she says that is the absolute worst place to, to work at because you know, women are biting against women, and it's just it's terrible. I said, you should try to run a restaurant when you got a bunch of waitresses like that. <laughs> we got to live in harmony. Amen. <laughs> yeah. The next one is forbearance, and forbearance and patience, you know, it's the, it's the same word, but boy, I, I, I was talking to Heather about this forbearance, and man, it, it's a lovely word. It's a lovely definition. It's putting up with others even when one is severely tired. Putting up with others, even when you're so tired and you're so worn out, and it's like, man, we're just, 
you keep running around that same tree over and over, and you, you know, we're not getting anywhere. So you got this fort, you're tired, and, but yet, because we want them to grasp the love of God so much, we continue to be there for them. We're like, come on, can you just get it this one time? Can you just grab a hold of it? Just come on. I'm, I know it's tiring. I know it's tired getting, you know, running around this. The, it's like a merry-go-round just keeps going on. But come on, let's jump off. Let's take some steps. And even though it gets tiring, hey, guys, we're patient with them. Why? Because God was patient with us, wasn't he? How long did he wait for some of us to get, finally get in step, right? How long did he wait for us to say, man, it's about time. You know, I had all these good plans for you, but, you know, you had to be all about yourself for so long, be running off and doing what you want to do. And this whole time, I'm sitting here saying, come on, come, come on home, son. I got something good for you. But yet, you know, we're like that prodigal son, and, you know, we're just out there just doing what we want to do until finally we come back. He's patient. And so we've got to be patient. We've got, we, we got to have this forbearance at work in our life. Kindness. Kindness. It's doing thoughtful deeds to others. Doing something nice for somebody else. Now, you know, that could go in so many, so many different ways. But it's kind of sad that more Christians aren't practicing this. And I'll, I'll tell you why we're not in a minute. But kind of just doing something for somebody else. You know, Larry said it good this morning. We're, we're so in love with ourselves sometimes. We're so in love with ourselves that we, we forget about other people. Why? Because we're, we're constantly just concerned about what's going on in our little world. But kindness, doing those thoughtful deeds for others. Now, goodness, showing generosity to others. Now, that, that generosity could be many different things. It could be your time, it could be your money, it could be your talents, whatever that is. But, you know, having generosity, being good to somebody. Faithfulness. Faithfulness, that, that's trustworthiness, being reliable. You know, if you, it, a lot of times, I remember hearing my grandpa, he always talked about this. He said, you know, if I gave somebody my word, if I told them I was going to be there, I'd be there. That's taking a man at his word. And now today, you can't take anybody at their word. Matter of fact, you have, a, you have to have a contract signed and lawyers dot it so that, you know what, you can't go about, you can't go against your word. I can't remember, I, I don't remember where I heard this at, but um, there was a guy who, uh, who is fan, uh, the Dukes of Hazard. Everybody, anybody remember the Dukes of Hazard? Okay, well, the Dukes of Hazard was really based off his family. And one of his cousins was, was writing a book about this crazy moonshining family, right? And so he wrote a book, and Hollywood, they came, and they, they did a deal with him, and all of a sudden, Dukes of Hazard gets on air, right? Well, the guy that wrote the book and stuff like that, he wanted, he wanted what was due to him. And uh, so he takes Hollywood, whoever it was, to court, and they're, they're in this court session, and one of the, the, the lawyers, or whoever it was, said, well, we never had anything official in writing. We just said we would do this for him. So there's nothing official. And the judge said, wait a minute. Uh, it is because you just admitted it in my courtroom. You're going you're gonna to have to uphold your word. You're going to have to uphold your word. Yeah. Our words need to be binding. When we say something to somebody, hey... We, as Christians, we need to be trustworthy and reliable to do it. Right. Faithful. Uh, gentleness, being meek and um, uh, humility, you know. Uh, Self-control. Self-control is victory over sinful desires. Victory over sinful desires. So now we've got a, a brief definition of what, you know, the fruit of the Spirit is. But, you know, uh, a lot of times we get caught up in just trying to be morally good, right? It's just a moral action. So now that you know some of these things, the right person, you know, if you're smart and you're intelligent, you'd say, well, you know what, I'm going to start doing these things, I'm going to practice these things, uh, I'm going to have this moral outlook about myself, and I'm going to do these things. And I'm going to be morally sound, but guess what? That's why so many people don't do it. Right? Because it's just a moral issue going on in their head. And they really don't have the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, alive in them, prompting them to do that. See, that's the difference. That's the difference. If you have the Holy Spirit alive in you, then we should be bearing fruit. 
This is the fruit that should be evident in our life. And if we had this fruit evident in our life, hey, let me tell you something. You can rest assured that you're in a good spot with God. So many times the fruit of the Spirit is the exception in the Christian life instead of the uh, norm, if you will. Right? All this fruit that I'm talking about, it should be the norm of our life. This is how we should be walking. We should be filled with the Spirit. And this fruit should be evident every day of our life, not an exception. And the people that make it an exception are the ones that, you know, hey, come on. Get back to the basics. Get back to the cross. You, you lost it. If, if the fruit of the Spirit isn't the norm in your life, it's the exception. And you need to do something about it. And you can. And you just you, you have to get right with the Lord. So the first fruit, love. And we're, we're going to talk about love. Agape. Now, one of the reasons I think love is so, the first fruit that's mentioned, is, it's because it's who God is. It's an attribute of God. Love is God. Um, look at Exodus 34, 6. It says this. <clears throat> that is not what I wanted. Daughters, prostitutes, them sitting out. No, that is not. That is not. Yeah, I need six, not 16. Yeah, that's not love, guys. Let's just flip over there and read it real quick. How about that? Started reading that, I was like, man, that that's not that's not what I had. Thirty-four six says this, and he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love, abounding in love, and faithfulness. Abounding in love and faithfulness. Now, that, that's something who God is. God is abounding in love. Love is a part of God. Uh, John 3.16, you know, it's a verse that we all know. For God so loved the world that He did what? He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. So, so God did something out of love. Romans 5, uh, 5 through 8 says this, And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out His love into our hearts. By the Holy Spirit. How? By the Holy Spirit. He's poured it into our hearts. Whom he, whom, he, whom he has given us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Verily, very rarely, rarely will, him, will anyone die for a righteous man, though a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But verse 8 says this, But God demonstrated His own love for us, in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's an agape kind of love. That Christ died for us while we, while we were still sinners. That, that, that's, you know, something that, he, that we couldn't do on our own. We, we were powerless. I like 1 John chapter 4, um, 8 and 16. It says this. Whoever does not, or whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. I, I, you can't get more, more straight than that right there. If you don't love, you don't know God. Why? Because God is love. God is love. And so we know and rely on the love of God has for us. God is love. Again, God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in Him. Hey, that's a pretty good uh, assurance right there, isn't it? That if you have the, this, this love going on in your life, that God is love, and we're walking in that love, that, that, that's a good assurance of where we're standing. The greatest example of this God kind of love is our salvation. Now, why do I say that? Why? Because it's a sacrificial, remember what I said what love was? It's a sacrificial, unmerited deed. A sacrificial, unmerited deed. That's exactly what Christ did on the cross. He sacrificed the only one, the perfect the perfect Lamb of God laid down His life for us. Why? Because there was no other way that we could get brought near to God. And so this was a sacrifice. God sacrificed His Son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. 
And then after that sacrifice, that allowed us to come into Him. It allowed us to, to join our Heavenly Father. Without it, we'd still be hopeless and we'd still be lost. But because of the blood of Christ, because of what He'd done on the cross, it drew us into Him. It was that gift that nobody could ever give you. Right? It says, uh, you know, as much as we want to think all of our good deeds and our good actions w would get us to heaven, they won't. They're just filthy rags before God. Why? Because none of us are righteous. The only righteous one that has ever walked the earth was Jesus Christ. And so when He sacrificed His life for us, it brought us near to God. That's the best kind of agape love that you can think of. That's why Jesus, you know, He says, you know, no greater love than a man is than this, that He would lay down His life for a friend. And that's what He did for us. Now, how is this, what about us? What about Christians? What is, what is love? What should it look like? What should this fruit look like, in our, look like in our life? And the attributes for Christians, you know, look at John 13, 34 and 35. It says, A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must Love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Now, look, we can pause right there. Now, we, we are about making disciples in this church. Did we mess up? Yeah. We did. You know what Larry shared this morning broke my heart. It made me sick at my stomach. That someone came in here and we, we, we just missed it. There's no excuse for it. We just missed it. And I think God allowed us to miss it. So that we could do a reality check. You know those self-righteous churchgoers that I was talking about a few weeks ago? Hey, I'm telling you, we're in jeopardy. We've got to get back to the cross. We've got to get back to to serving God and loving people. Serving God and loving people. They will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Now, at the same time that that was going on, we had another couple that, you know, stayed after church and had just the opposite testimony. But I think we needed a reality check so that we don't do that again, so that we don't take for granted anyone that comes through these doors, that we show them the love of Christ, and that we show them the way to Christ. Romans 12, 9 and 10 says this. It says, Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Honor one another above yourselves. Hmm. Boy, Larry, how did you do on that? <coughs> Honor one another above yourselves. Love what's good. Hate what's evil. 1 Peter 1, 22 and 23 says this. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. Not some kind of superficial kind of love, but you love each other deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring Word of God. So let's love deeply and from the heart. Deep from the heart, not, not something that's just, you know, the outward action of how we're supposed to act in church. If we're just acting that way, then it's foolishness. It's rubbish. It's rubbish. But let's really get to the love. Let's really love each other like the Word tells us to love. And then 1 John, back to 1 John 4, uh, chapter, uh, verse 7. It says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. And knows God. Now, we can go on and skip to verse 11 through 21, and I'll tell you exactly what this says because I'm sure you don't want me to have to read all those verses to you, right? But it's about love. It's about our love with God. But more importantly, 
when that love is evident in our life, we can rest assured that we belong to God. We belong to God. Now, once again, this only happens. This only happens because of the Holy Spirit living in us. If we're born again, the Holy Spirit should be living in us. He should be indwelling our bodies. And when if He's indwelling our bodies, then this love, right, that I'm talking about, as, as well as all the other fruit, should be evident in our life every single day. And the, the most beautiful thing about love that I could possibly imagine is that love always, always brings us back to Christ. Always brings us back. Why? Paul says right over here, it says if you live, you know, your spirit and your flesh, are, they're, they're warring at each other so that you don't do what you want to do. And so this love that we have for Christ is the reason why we don't go too far in our sin. It brings us back to the cross. Why? Because we're born of God. We're born of God. God lives in His Holy Spirit lives in us. Not this church, okay? Not this building, but each inside, each and every one. God dwells in here. And the fruit should be evident, amen? Right. It should be evident that God dwells in here. The, the fruit of love compels us to give our time, our money, our talents, everything. It compels us to live a life worthy to be called Christians to be called disciples of Jesus Christ. So my question for you is this this morning. How is this fruit being used in your life? How is the fruit of love being used? How is it being uh, seen in your life? Or is it something that's just been covered up? Or is it something that's just, you, you know the right thing to do, but you're just, uh, that's the only reason you're doing it? It's really not coming from the heart. You're really not loving, you know, that the brotherly love from deep within. It's just on the surface. I'm telling you, if we just keep it at the surface, we're going to fall. So is it alive in you? Let's, let's just be real honest. Is, 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 this, is the fruit of the Spirit alive within this body? Let's just bring it back. For, let me take that back. Is the fruit of the Spirit alive within you? Or do we go back and we see some of these things that, you know, acts of the sinful nature? And if you was to, you know, draw a line and, you know, start writing down some things that were a result of the sinful nature and, you know, things that you think are going right, you know, what fruit you, that you have according to the Spirit. Maybe you don't have all nine showing up in your life. What, what you need to do is ask the Holy Spirit to come into you and to fill you so that you can have this fruit, all nine, all, everyone that's mentioned, alive and well, working in your life. Every day. Will you fall? Yeah, there's going to be days that we mess up. There's going to be days that we fall, but... When we do, when we yield to the sinful nature, the Spirit's going to draw us back. And if that's happening in your life, you can rest assured that you're in a good, good standing with God. But if you're, you're, if you're caught up in sin and you have no conviction, you have none of this, the, this fruit in your life, you, you don't have any of it alive and well within your being, let me tell you something. Don't kid yourself. Don't play games right now. You need Jesus. You need Him to save you from the, the life that you think that you're, you're living, all right? We need Him each and every day. And if you're not asking Him to fill you each and every day to walk according to the Scripture, I don't know how else to put it. It's, it's not going to be good.
That's a good way to put it, Larry. Right from the Word. Right. That's a that's a good ending right there. That's what I that's that's what I was trying to get at. Thank you. Let's bow our heads. If we don't have the Spirit, we're not of God. A good man. There's good people in this world that don't know Jesus. Jesus.